Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good? Making it through another great ISTE conference, right? Fantastic. I see some familiar faces here. I see some folks that have been with us a couple of times. We appreciate you coming back. Um, I'm just going to get us kicked off here with, a, with some brief introductions. Uh, my name is Tim Baldwin. I'm president of the U.S. Uh, for its learning. Uh, where I come from, the, the length of the introduction should be inversely proportional to the impact of the speakers. And so I'm going to keep this one really short because we've got some really impactful speakers here today to talk about creating comprehensive, resource-rich, and flexible learning experiences. So I don't know exactly what that means, but I know we're going to find out in a couple of hours. It's going to be great. Um, so today we have two speakers and four panelists. Uh, our speakers are internationally recognized for their education leadership and thought leadership. And we have Alan November and Shelley Terrell. And in addition, we have four panelists that are active in districts and that are going to help us understand how this, all of what we talk about can be applied at the district level. We have Nick Williams, uh, from the, who's the coordinator of instructional technology from the Bartholomew uh, Consolidated School District. We have Adrian Acosta, who's the instructional technology director from Houston Independent School District. Uh, also joining us is Angela Burgess, uh, which is who, and she's the instructional technology specialist for, for Scythe County in Georgia. And last but not least, we have Crystal Weiss, who's an ed tech facilitator from Spring Branch, Texas. So well represented across the country here. Um, so with that, we're going to jump right in. Please come up with some good questions for the end, because we're going to have a good chance for Q&A as you're, as you're going through this session. Um, and we're going to kick it off here with Alan. You ready to go? Everyone. Oh, Jill, do me a favor. Push a button that works. That makes it. I always bring a kid with you. That's what I've learned. To make it make it go. Um, yeah, just stop there. That's good. I like that. Do you know what you're looking at? Do you know what this is? What is that? Piece of technology. What does that do? Yeah, it's toilet. Yeah, it's a control panel for a Japanese toilet. I've used it. I've, I've used it. And if you've never used it, uh, let, let's see if, is that zooming in? Yeah. I want to particularly talk about what these buttons do. Whoop, too much, too much. I have to, you know what, I have to get down so I can actually see what you see. And uh, you see these top three buttons? Those do amazing things to your body. Um, I want to talk about what the amazing things are. Uh, so I was, in, I was in Tokyo, I was giving a talk, and my, my host, very nice, they gracious, and take me out, and I wanted to go shopping, because I'm redoing a, an 1890 house in Massachusetts, and I'm doing the bathrooms, and uh, so I'm always looking for cool design ideas wherever I go, and Japan had these amazing toilets. Have any of you used this toilet? Anybody else in the room besides me? You, just me? Use toilet, Shelly? You saw it? Shelly's just saw it. So they, they took me to a smart house store. And we don't have them, but they have them. And they took, they took me along with a friend. And uh, they asked me if I want to go use it. They said, it's all set up, the plumbing, everything works. You may want to use it, get the full experience. And they said, to get the full experience, you should sit down. I didn't need to sit down, but I sat down. And they, they gave, but what I didn't, they didn't tell me. This is so important that you keep track of this. It comes with a remote control. You do not want to lose the remote control to somebody else. The other person came with another American presenter, a sense of humor of a 12-year-old, and they gave my friend the remote without telling me. So he's got the remote, and I'm in, sitting, and he decided to turn it on. And there wasn't even a concept to turn it on. And, and there's no toilet paper, right? It's a warm spritz and a dry. That, that's how it goes. And the, the advertising, I saw the brochure, it says it's quite soothing. But not if you lose the remote, then it's rough. Because in mine, the, um, the LCD thing was on the side. I could see it. And a, my friend turns on, a sea lion popped up. 
animated sea lion. They got a lot of animations in, in Japan, a lot of animation graphics. So the animation sea lion pops up and it starts juggling beach balls. One, then two, then three, then four beach balls going around and around. So I'm wondering, what's with these beach balls, right? Who cares that a sea lion is juggling beach balls? Well, it turns out you should care because the number of beach balls represents the pressure of the, of the spritz that you don't know is coming. You, you have no idea that's gonna hit you. And nobody needs four. Two beach balls is plenty. You just don't need four. Set it to two. Four, you will fly off a toilet faster than you ever dreamed possible. So that's what happened to me. I flew off and my friend's laughing, everybody's laughing. And, uh, and at the time, the time I was there, this thing was $2,500 for this toilet. And this, this, this toilet has dropped in price. Uh, used to be a lot more, like $20,000. Um, when it was $20,000, 80,000 people bought it. 80, I, I asked, 80,000 units were sold at 20 odd thousand dollars. What would motivate you to spend $20,000 not the spritz and the dry, I can tell you that. That's not worth 20,000. What's worth 20,000? Well, it turns out there's a computer chip in the bowl. You probably know where this is going. There's a computer chip in the bowl, and uh, it does a complete you know, wellness check. It's a lab, like going to the doctor, but home. And uh, so it, it does a wellness check, and it sends it to your, your watch. You get a little app, goes with it or your iPad, or whatever device you want, and it shows you graphs of your blood sugar and all kinds of things. So it generates data, it generates information. It generates information and it gives it to you. And your toilet doesn't do that, right? Your, your toilet doesn't do that. And uh, what's fascinating is that, well in Boston where I live, there's a lot of biotech stuff. And, and these days, um, they figured out that Patterns of different protein are associated with the start of different cancers. This is actually quite serious. So if your protein pattern changes, it's an indicator of a very specific kind of cancer. So the goal of this technology is to figure out how do we catch cancer in a couple thousand cells instead of a couple hundred million cells, which is more typical when they catch it, a couple hundred million. So this is quite serious. If they, can, if they can alert you when it's a couple of thousand, then your options are wide options. So it's, but you can't go to the doctor's office every day. So what they have to do is figure out how to move the technology where you are. So you're all gonna have this. It's quite serious, what's coming, quite serious. And it, and it sends the data to your doctor's office as a, also. So it's not just you, your doctor's still involved. And what intrigues me is the people who resisted this the most in Japan were the doctors. It was the doctors. They control the information before this came along, their labs, their knowledge, all that expertise of what to do with data and how to diagnose, and specifically for you, what to tell you. And then all of a sudden, that's yanked away from them and everybody is their own diagnostician. So they were concerned that people wouldn't be educated to know what to do with the data, right? And make some silly decisions about thinking they know when they didn't know. And I can understand that, right? You can understand that doctors don't want to feel that loss of quality control. By the way, resistance does intrigue me. I'm fascinated. I don't know if you know this, but there are some teachers who resist technology. And, <laughs> and I think for the right reasons. In the beginning, I didn't respect it, I'm gonna be honest with you, but now I do. Now I've learned to acknowledge and respect because they care about their kids and they, they might be worried about losing control. I actually think that a sense of loss of control may be the single biggest barrier to not using technology well. My opinion, right? Anybody agree with that in the room? Whoa, whoa, a lot of people do. All right, so uh, let me kind of move on. Story goes on. Uh, right, Jill? Click, oh, she's back there. I need her. The left hit, hit something that gets me that one. I just don't ever use PowerPoint. Yeah, you get, stop her, I like her, okay. Um, 
So, as you can imagine, I like the word synergy. It's one of my favorite words, synergy. I just like saying it. Um, when you connect two devices together that normally are not connected, so the toilet is connected to the refrigerator, right? Say yes, thank you. And the refrigerator has big LCD, does lots of things, she's pointing, it's interactive, it has uh, on the handle, there's the thumbprint thing that's on your phone. So when you grab the handle of the refrigerator, it knows who you are. By the way, the toilet knows who you are too, but with a different recognition system <laughs> than, than the handle. Yeah, we'll talk about that later if we have time. And uh, I was going somewhere. Yes, so, and it speaks to you, so it knows who you are. So in my case, I'm just gonna tell you, I go to the bathroom first, then I go to the, then I go to the kitchen in the morning to get breakfast and open the refrigerator door and it uh, welcomes me, right? It says, good morning, Alan. May we suggest more fiber today? Because it knows I need fiber from the toilet that said it, it measures and I get the information right where I need it. Right at the moment, I'm going to use it. I like that. I don't have to memorize it and carry it from the toilet. It's right where I need it. Do, are you laughing at me? I, I have feelings. Okay. <laughs> Any questions so far? Good. So, uh, from here, I'm gonna make an enormous leap to it's learning. Are you ready? <laughs> Arna is not ready for this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, my own opinion of this whole big thing we're trying to do, the real revolution is not technology, it's information. So I don't wanna focus on technology, I want to focus on information. You need the technology. You need the computer chip. But really, you don't want it to get in your way. You just want it to be part of the environment, invisible, seamless. You don't want to have to make it work. Do you know what I'm talking about? So that's my own sense. And I, I like things like this, um, where I can get information I never had before, and I can use it in new ways, nutrition, exercise. I can take more control over my own body my own wellness as a shift of control to the patient from the doctor. Massive shift of control, but only if I learn, and I'll, I'll, try, my, I'll try to do that. And I think that's the big analogy. I, I think inevitably there's going to be a big shift of control from teachers to learners. I think it's inevitable. What we're seeing happen, you know, just about every answer is on the internet if I give an assignment. Um, but I do believe, as in the case of doctors, who are more important, not less, because of this technology, because now there's prevention, and there's proactive, it's much better. I also think with teachers, they're more important than ever, even though there's this shift of control. So it sounds inconsistent, but not in my mind. In my mind, it's very consistent. So I just want to show you some right-click Spacebar? Okay. So, by the way, all of this is in a big category called the Internet of Things. You can Google that, Internet of Things. The Internet of Things basically says that your lighting, your refrigerator, your thermostat, your doorbell, your car, your clothing, your toilet are all going to be on the web. Lots of things that are plugged in to electricity are going to be on the Internet. Internet of Things. Huge, massive change coming to society, not just your computer. All right, we're good with that? Internet of Things. All right, this is all part of that. So, here's what I've learned. You get new connections between things you didn't have before. Toilet, refrigerator. You get uh, generating information in real time, as it is happening, right? Education's often delayed, by the way. We're gonna get to that. And, uh, you empower people who are closest to the problem. So there's a shift from the doctor to the patient. Closest to the problem gets more empowerment. In our business, kids are closer to the problem than teachers. And then there's some resistance, typically. And the people who resist tend to be the people with the most knowledge, which I understand. OK. Uh, so what I want to do is. Uh, give you some examples 
of the analogy probably only works in my mind. Uh, this is a, a, web, a website. A friend of mine had to build this, but you have its learning where all of this is done for you, seamless, like, like the toilet. And uh, uh, if you look at the view count on my friend's website that he built, this, this uh, little tutorial, which runs three minutes if I played it for you, has been seen 92,000 times. A 12-year-old did that. It turns out that a lot of children would prefer to listen to a child explain something they don't understand than a teacher. I don't mean to insult teachers. It's just the natural behavior of children. It's just natural. And believe it or not, I've asked children why they don't ask their teachers for help when they know they don't understand something. And in the beginning, I almost couldn't believe what some children told me why. They said, if I ask my teacher for help, it's like I'm telling my teacher they didn't do a good job when they taught me. So I can't ask them for help. I just couldn't believe, I heard, I've heard this many times. Or yesterday, a teacher came to my classroom and said that when a student comes up to him and asks for a question, that they often apologize first. I'm sorry, I have a question. How can you be sorry? Do you know what I'm talking about? I bet you've heard that. So there's all these emotional barriers in front of children sometimes to ask their, so they go to a friend and they say to their friend, what just happened in class? I think one of the best things you could do with its learning is build a library of tutorials designed by children. Plus, Harvard's done some research on this, and if you Google curse of knowledge, the curse of knowledge, have any of you read about curse of knowledge? Curse of knowledge, I didn't believe it at first. Now I do, I bought it, I have bought it. Uh, curse of knowledge basically says Harvard professors know too much to understand a first time learner's issues. I don't think it's limited to Harvard professors. I think there are teachers, first grade, third grade, physics, art, who know so much about their subject, they don't understand all the misconceptions and background issues of children, but the way a child explains something is often childlike. So I love this. I love that children are gonna create and contribute to the benefit of other children. Why not, right? Purpose, responsibility, design. I think it's a good thing. Just out of curiosity. Oh, and his website, it's, there's a child design tutorial for the entire curriculum. Every problem in the curriculum. Every single problem. It's massive. It took him years to do it. My friend, Eric Marcos, LA, sixth grade math teacher. I know him well, I was there when he started this thing um, years ago. That girl who did that one, she's now at Georgetown, uh, and I know her too. Um, he was in the bottom third of test scores on standard tests in California. He is number one in the district. It works. It's a release of control, it's a shift of control where teachers should answer questions, but some kids need 10 times, they won't ask a teacher 10 times, but they will play rewind 10 times. So it's in, I think kids need a lot more support than any teacher has time for an entire class. It's not humanly possible for a teacher to be completely successful under the current conditions of how we've designed schools. Kids need too much help. So off we go, that's an, that's an example of people closest to the problem, in this case creating content, and build collabor collaboration to opportunity to contribute. Uh, these are kids, uh, these photos were sent to me from Virginia, Loudoun County, Virginia. Any of you are from Virginia? Maryland. Maryland. Loudoun County is uh, Dulles Airport to give you a sense of where Loudoun County is. Uh, 
these kids, uh, the elementary kids on the left and the middle school kids on the right, are, uh, they've just finished taking a test individually that the teacher collected so the teacher knows the individual scores of the test, of all the kids, and then the teacher does not take the test home and correct it and go over it the next day. She immediately gives the kids the same test again, and they work with each other without being told the answers to get a perfect score on the test they just took. Do any of you manage tests like this? Any of you seen this? Crazy idea. Uh, you want to see where this idea came from? There's a YouTube video called AP50. It's a Harvard professor named Eric Mazur, the dean of applied physics at Harvard. That's where I got the idea. I watched his class. And Eric Mazur, who invented Facebook and clickers and flip learning, he's genius. Um, he really did invent Facebook. He figured out that you need, you need information as fast as you can when you're learning. If you take a test home and you correct it and you give it back two or three days later, the brain sits on a mistake and then it goes into long-term memory. So you can make the same mistake on a final that you made on an earlier test, the exact same mistake, even though the teacher corrected it and gave it back two or three days later because of how the brain works. So you want to give immediate feedback, kind of like the toilet, immediate use. As fast as you can, fast as you can. And so this process, if you've never, and I have a feeling none of you have ever done this, but what's fascinating that happens is the teacher has the original test for individual, and then the teacher gets the group test back and compares the two tests. And what will happen is a student who got the right answer on the individual test might change their answer to a wrong answer when the group takes the test. Which means the kid didn't really understand. The kid had just regurgitated without knowing. Did it? But the, the teacher would have corrected the test correctly, that the kid was correct in really not understanding but getting a right answer. Does that make sense? But in this process, because the teacher is listening, you learn a lot more about the level of understanding of the assessment rather than just the answers when you correct it at home. It's incredibly insightful for the teacher. Really powerful. I recommend you try this. And then at the end, you just give the kids the answers. You don't have to go home and come back and take tomorrow out to do it. Not only that, but kids will ask each other 10 times in a group setting. They might not ask the teacher 10 times when the teacher gives the test back to the whole class. It's incredibly powerful. So I've shown this. Eric Mazur also gets the highest test scores compared to other physics professors at Harvard on the same test, final exam. He's the only professor who does it at Harvard out of 17, even with overwhelming results of how successful this process is. Overwhelming data. Significantly better in his class. No other Harvard professor has adopted that process. And I don't anticipate they ever will. Resistance is very powerful A new ways of doing things. Really powerful especially if you think you know everything, like if you're a Harvard professor, or you're a doctor in Japan. If you think you're really, really good at what you do, it can be difficult to change, right? So we need leaders who have a capacity. I think the number one leadership skill is to help people take risk of doing things they've never done. I think that is the number one leadership skill of a principal or curriculum director or coach is really helping people let go of control and take risk. And the two, the two classrooms you're looking at in Loudoun County have phenomenal results on their test scores. Now luckily, in the left, the principal who sent me that, all the teachers are doing it. So it is possible. But I'm convinced you need a good leader to support the risk taking, because it's so different. 
especially if a parent calls up, time, are we, really? I'll finish that. Especially if a parent calls up and said, my teacher's not teaching my kid, they're correcting their own test, that's ridiculous. So we have to have leaders who are able to respond to parents who are not used to this kind of innovation of change. Resistance can come from lots of different places, right? We just have to be prepared for it. It's all manageable. They manage it quite well. All right, so to wrap up uh, my part, real revolution's information. Who controls it? Who's responsible for it? The other part of the revolution, I think, is about relationships. Kid to kid, kid to teacher. I think we should focus on the quality of relationships and how we work together. So in, in both images, in the, the, and in the earlier image I showed you of the opportunity of posting tutorials, I think the student to student relationship deserves a tremendous amount of our observation and attention. I think there's a lot of opportunity, peer to peer, to improve learning, both because of the curse of knowledge and the natural behavior of kids to want to help each other. So I like, I like images like this. So hopefully those ideas were good enough to criticize, and uh, I look forward to the panel and questions at the end. Thanks, guys. clicker, right? So if I stand over there, you won't see me. <laughs> um, so I tend to start, you might have seen earlier a little baby coming around. <laughs> um, that's actually my baby. This is my daughter, Savannah. And um, I bring her to ISTE. She's actually what I've called um, the ISTE baby because her father, who's a teacher at Houston, um, we met um, at ISTE. So it's a way to commemorate four years later how we got together. So, <laughs> um, but I think this is a great honor to be here. I always enjoy spending time with teachers who take the time to fly. You know, um, a lot of you come from different places and it's a great way to honor you, especially you just did a year of, you know, great accomplishments. So I wanna start by giving you a hand clap because you all do a lot of really great things. Um, and it's good to take the moment to celebrate like this. Um, but also, I think what we're coming here together for is to really ensure that our students have access to a bright future. And this is really important to me because growing up, um, I'm actually a first generation um, college graduate, Latina, and my dad, when we were young, we actually grew up in the poorest district in San Antonio, so much that it was a Supreme Court case. And the Supreme Court case said uh, for Edgewood that basically in the poor schools, you're not getting a great education. So we were in this poor area, and the reason I tell you this is because a lot of kids still, this is the kind of kids you teach still. And my dad knew, he didn't really know how to get us to college or anything like that, but he knew that if we were gonna get out of this poverty cycle, which for years had been in the family, then the only way we were gonna do that is to graduate from college. So one of the things he did every day was say, okay, he started the conversation with his five daughters, when you graduate from college, okay? And the other part was um, he knew that technology was one of the ways that would really bring us to that, and he knew college and career readiness programs. He heard about one that was available for uh, kids who were in a free and reduced lunch program. It was called PREP, this pre-engineering program. So since middle school, I used to go to college campuses in the summer, and I would work with professors, I would be at the campus, get to use their technology, and I got to do really great, incredible things. And so, for me, that gave me a lot of opportunities, and all five of us did graduate from college. So that was really great. <laughs> well, more clap to my dad for, for knowing that. Um, but with that, you know, I remember, so eventually I got a scholarship to go to one of those campuses. And that's where I first ran into a learning management system, an LMS. And I remember because the lab was 24 hours, I was addicted to this because I had never learned in a, a, in a place that 
you know, it tied the computer. Uh, you could just go in and I could check financial aid, I could check the syllabus, I could check my grades, and I always wanted, I was just obsessed with knowing this data. And at first, it was just very much one way, that's what it was. I could check the calendar or see when the test was. But now it's grown so much. If you've seen some of the things that it's learning does, it's just phenomenal. Now you can integrate with like, you know, different types of applications where your students can create, your students can do a really amazing things. It's not like they can only take a test or they can only do um, where they e e e turn in work or anything like that. They can actually create, they can make, they can do really great things. And with that comes challenges. Because when you do have a lot of creation, um, so, Within six months, I, I teach a program at a, the community college in San Antonio, and we have students who couldn't, um, they weren't college ready, so they, they weren't able to go. Um, so we have this special program. They didn't probably make the test scores right. They don't have the reading skills. Some of my students have reading and writing skills at a fifth and sixth grade level. And so I have to get them ready. And I, I asked to be part of this program because uh, I think it's really important. And my students, they give me a lot of insight. So within four or five months, these are the kind of projects we do that we can do because it's all, like Alan was describing, it just makes it so easy to be able to you know, get your students to turn this in and to be able to use the apps that are integrated within it. It just makes it easier for the students to do. So within four or five months, this is, uh, they do problem solution videos, they make uh, PSAs, and they actually propose um, simple solutions to problems. Um, they make, they do uh, portfolios, their digital portfolios where they do their entire reflections. They annotate, they create essays, they do infographics, they do podcasts, but the challenge is, how do you grade 100 of those? I mean, which is a really big challenge. The time, so yes, I love doing these projects and everything like that, but I can't watch 100 videos. I can't really effectively grade. And now that I have one and a half year old, I definitely don't want to spend hours doing this. So what happened was, I realized um, when I was learning, using the learning management system, if I'm going to do this, I really got to adapt. And, and a lot of people you know, tend to look at me as a tech guru, but I still learn every day. I still learn how to um, change the way that they teach because that is part of it. So we want to make it very powerful and effective. Um, there's a lot of way that we can differentiate and things like that, but we've got to try and test things um, and see, and so I still learn. And one of the really powerful things that I've learned, and Alan already talked about it actually, <laughs> so I don't even have to go through all that. But in order to accomplish all that, to promote student voice, to differentiate instruction, to meet all of these demands as a teacher, is community. So I actually do not do all the grading. I do not do all the effective feedback or anything. What we've done is my students, they give the feedback to each other. So we have three levels of assessment. Um, but one of the first ones is that they all get to, and we walk, I walk them through the process of what it means to give effective feedback. So first of all, we'll look at an example, for example, the infographic. We'll take a look at what's a good infographic, we'll evaluate it, we'll analyze. And then in groups or pairs, we'll define, the students get to define, okay, you know, what makes this particularly well designed? They'll think of things like, oh, well, I like the colors. I like the font. So that's important, visual literacy. Um, but then the information, how's the information presented? You know, and we'll ask questions like that. And we come up with a checklist. And then that checklist for them becomes what they evaluate each other on. So they're learning in the process also that part of the design. And then they can give off of that checklist feedback to each other. They let them know, okay, well, it's kind of hard to read your font, you know, that bright yellow on a lime green background, you know, and they, they really give each other really good, you know, criticism and evaluation in a constructive way. And, you know, and if they don't, we, we, we look at that and then we get better at it and we keep getting better at it. 
And so they end up giving the most rich feedback to each other than I could ever give. And then that gives me some time to when I finally look and they evaluate themselves as well. Because after they've evaluated each other off of these criteria that they came up with, they also get to see how they compared with everyone else. And then they get to go back and they get to fix it. And all my students, that's an option. This is an option for them. And they all choose to take that option. Now these are kids that struggled for a very long time, that weren't college ready. And then by the time those four or five months, they're able to get. I've had some of the highest scores, even with students who have, uh, my students have dyslexia, some of my students have, um, we've had students that also struggled with reading. Um, we've had students, a lot of students that English isn't their first language. So that's a lot to deal with in one class. But they've managed their scores and everything to rise significantly. And it's not me doing all of this, it's them and their peers. The other part that I want to say about community is that's really helped my practice. So what made me comfortable with this, because I just told you that my students grade each other and not me, <laughs> but um, what made me comfortable is because I am with a network. Um, online, I connect through Twitter, I connect through Facebook with educators and some other places, but like Facebook group for t um, teachers and stuff like that. And that's made me a better teacher. So basically what I did was just apply the in great learning and support that I've gotten um, throughout the years. And I thought, well, if it works for me, it's going to work for them. So the most amazing part of all this, too, is at the end of the semester when I get any kind of feedback, well, all the evaluations, most of my students say this. They say, thank you so much. We learned so much with technology. But what I really want to do is thank my peers. I've learned so much from my peers. Without their help, I couldn't have done this. And I get this time and time again. This is not part of the evaluation process. But they all say this, which I think is a very, very powerful lesson. So once again, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and being open to the possibilities of using the technology to do a lot of things. And I know it's a lot of challenges and struggles. And within the short period of time, I'm not going to be able to give you all the answers. But we do have panelists of teachers who deal with this. And they're going to go to each particular one and give you some uh, specific you know, uh, ways and tips, uh, practical ones, to really help you. And if you ever need, um, you know, have any questions or anything, I really do encourage you to connect. Um, there's a hashtag called EdChat. And pretty much any time you post a question on that, there's tons of teachers looking at the hashtag. And they'll help you out. Okay, so thank you all once again. <laughs>
Uh, and then Columbus, Indiana is where our district is, is the headquarters of Cummins Engine Company. And we also have just a, an amazing partnership between social, private, and public sectors. And we're able to do a lot as a community because of that, and one of them, again, is to support projects. So with that said, I would say there's three main pitfalls that we see okay. with this. The first one being is that because you're a project school or program, let's just do projects to do projects. <laughs> so it's like giving a, a student a computer and just saying to use it, right? So what we really work with our teachers on, and again, they're talking about what Alan was talking about, this is more of a facilitator than a teacher at this point, is that you have to have that end in mind. You have to have the goals and the reasons why. Don't just take on a project and say, oh, it kind of fits this standard, kind of fits that standard. Uh, really have that kind of planning out. And it does take a lot of time to plan, but then again, you kind of facilitate the learning from there. So that would be pitfall number one is don't do projects, just do projects mm -hmm. and kind of make them fit. The second one is uh, kind of this giving up control. You are now working with community partners and that is completely out of your control. So we have some absolutely fantastic partners. We actually have some project managers at their schools that work with these community partners, but it's just difficult because sometimes like, life happens, things happen on their end, and projects just kind of dissipate, and you have to learn from it and be okay and be flexible with just knowing that sometimes things just kind of fall out. And then the third one would be communication, and that is where we've been in its learning partner for over four years now. That communication piece, I, I know when I was in high school or in college and had to do a project, you're either the type that's like, man, I have to do everything, or I'm going to not have to do anything because that person's in my group, right? So there's always <laughs> that group kind of project-based working, and I, I probably see that in adult life as well, uh, of where one person is typically the lead. But it's learning will help us set goals, help us set checklists. Uh, we also align standards in there on soft skills, things like communication uh, and effort. Uh, that each student puts in. So that's, those are kind of the three pitfalls. Making sure you have great communication, not doing projects to projects, and then uh, just making sure that it's okay to let go sometimes when community things don't work out. Well, this is some great um, pitfalls. Now you, I know specifically you talked about PBL that inspires critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So what would be like, you said you worked with different age groups. Can you share with us examples of what that PDL looks like? Absolutely. Now, so the first one will start young grade. So third grade, uh, we have a really big farmer's market in our town uh, that goes from spring to fall. And the third graders will work completely on basically becoming this little small business that will develop something that they sell at the farmer's market and they run the booth, they do all the money uh, and, and handle all of that. So that one is very neat for, for at least some of our younger learners. Mm -hmm. As you move up, um, there was, we have an escape room in our town, uh, which is Escape 812, but they asked for ideas on how to design an escape room. So our middle schoolers, one of the teams That's designed cool different possibilities within that escape room kind of uh, limitations, and they were able to propose several, or pitch several ideas for them, and they actually have one right now that's running that our middle schoolers designed. If you get into high school, that's where it gets really exciting. So we've had groups that have worked uh, in houses in New Orleans on wiring them, so they've worked, our, some of our electricians in town travel down to New Orleans, do a week-long project on wiring houses. Uh, we've had a school build a windmill that one year was the design, then the next year the group came in and built it, and then the year after they've made sure it's functional and part of the grid. Uh, and then another one that, and these were all this year actually, so it's been kind of exciting. Um, so with the unfortunate uh, kind of events that happened in Parkland and kids taking action. We had a senior, this is the other 
part of our district that I haven't mentioned is that everyone has to do a senior project to graduate. So this is a senior uh, that really felt empowered that she wanted to make a difference. So she uh, hosted the first Pride event in our town. And it wouldn't be a huge deal, except for that the sitting vice president is from our town. So she actually got tons of media attention uh, because of just the atmosphere. And we had an amazing event where, again, she worked with the police, she worked with the city, uh, and it went off without a hitch, and she was on, she was in Cosmopolitan, she did all the media circuits, uh, and the schools ended up dealing with all of that. But in the end, it was her being empowered to make a difference, and I think that's what's important. So you gave some really, those are amazing examples, by the way, <laughs> of uh, problem-based learning. So wrap up for us, like in a definition, um, finish the statement. Powerful project-based learning inspires students to? I, I would say lead, act, uh, and, and just feel empowered in general. And I, again, I can, having two daughters in the system as well, couldn't ask for anything else uh, for my daughters as they graduate as well to have that leadership and act and empowerment. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and next? I believe we have Angela Burgess uh, to let you know a little bit about Angela. Well, you can see uh, there she's the Instructional Technology Specialist uh, for Forsyth County Public Schools in Georgia. Um, but she's going to talk to us today um, how about, about differentiated instruction. So she's going to let us know a little about that and how the keys to student voice choice, and also engagement, okay? So the first question we have for you, Angela, is, so doing all of that choice, voice, differentiated instruction, there's very limited time um, for teachers. Time's always a problem. So how can um, we, with that limited time, ensure all have a voice? So before I became an instructional technology specialist, um, my background is I was a French teacher. So voice is actually very, very important. I need to hear their literal voice, not just their typing voice. Um, and often I would have lots of different kids in the same class. So to do that, one of the things that I like to do is when I need to hear their actual voice, I might use something like Flipgrid or I might use an assignment and it's learning where they can record their answer and then I can listen to them as I have time. Because sometimes I don't need to take them to the language lab to have them record their answer and then me listen to it. Sometimes I just need them to sit at home, take some time to practice it, and then give me their voice. Um, so I can do something like that, but I also am a big believer in back channeling. And because I teach high school, I can use Twitter for back channeling, I can use Padlet. I used to love Today's Meet, and they sadly went away. <laughs> but I used to use all those different things so that I could make sure that everyone spoke up, even if it was virtually. And I try to do the same thing now that I don't work with well, not as much with um, students. I work with teachers now. I try to do the same thing when I have teachers in sessions with me. So I try to create a hashtag on Twitter. And you know, if they have questions, they can use the hashtag. Or with Google Slides, they can do the Q&A feature so that they can actually speak up as they have questions. And like Alan was saying earlier, so that feedback is immediate. Mm -hmm. I don't have to wait and come back afterwards and see where they're having questions. I can follow along and answer their questions right away because teachers are the same way as students. They won't necessarily raise their hand to ask the question. They'll just sit there, but they, will, they might type it. And so then that way I can answer those questions right away. So another tough topic that you talked about um, is differentiated instruction. And so what would be like, that's, for teachers it's really hard to just kind of jump into. So what would be like some simple steps or a place to start that would be good for teachers? So my biggest thing with differentiation is that it takes a lot of work up front, but it makes your life really easy on the other side. And a lot of people think that differentiation means that you're providing the same content for groups of students, but at different levels. And that is differentiation, but for me differentiation has a much different meaning. Um, I was speaking at my table earlier. Um, I often had a situation where I would have co two completely different levels in my classroom. So I would have French two students, and I would have French three students, or French four students and AP students. And I have to get them 
all to the next level because if I teach my French two and my French three the same way but just assess them at different levels, then the French two kids aren't gonna go on to take French three. And for the sake of my program, I need them to go on and do different things. So it takes a lot of background work ahead of time, but then what that means is that you can set it up so that the kids are doing their own learning and you are facilitating that learning because you've set everything up for them so that they get what they need when they need it and you're able to walk around and it looks like organized chaos or maybe disorganized chaos. But it, you know, everyone's getting what they need when they need it. It's just not you doing all of the giving. Um, and I think that's the same thing, again, going back to what I do now most of the time is working with that with teachers, doing that same thing, coming up with asking teachers what they need and then providing those different solutions. So it takes a ton of work on the front side, but then it just goes. Hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, it just goes. <laughs> Um, and then finally, um, I know um, you are, well, actually, you kind of, <laughs> so you also mentioned not just differentiation, but differentiated solutions. Can you kind of define that and give like examples what you mean by that solutions part? So for me, a lot of that is that I don't, just because, so I, I love to read. I love to write, but I'm not artistic at all. So I always hated those projects where the teacher was like, draw your response. And they thought they were, they thought they were being so nice because I was going to get to draw. But I'm so unartistic that I was like, can't I just write an essay? Please just let me write an essay. Um, and so I think that that's the type of thing that we need to think about because other kids. I see that. So. Thank you. Okay, good. The other kids, you know, they might love, they might be, they're so artistic and they could do their drawing. They could do their illustration or whatever and they could speak about it so much more eloquently than they might be able to write about it. But at the end, if they're showing the same information, if they're showing that they've learned the information, does it really matter whether they painted a picture or did a cartoon or made a movie or wrote an essay or gave a speech, as long as they're showing that they learned and that they mastered what they need to know. And there's no, there's, there's no one right solution that is like, this is the way it must be done. This is the only way it must be done, no matter what college board might tell us. Um, <laughs> You know, there's lots of different ways to show that you know information, and it's what's really important is just that you know the information. So I like to put that out there. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> it was very enlightening. <laughs> okay, and now we have Adrian Acosta. Adrian is uh, instructional tech director from Houston ISD, where that's not my neighborhood. So, <laughs> um, and he's actually going to be talking about. Um, decreasing um, the equity and accessibility gaps. So your first question. Um, so I think one of the problems, and you know, it's very dear to my heart too, is that teachers do want you know, um, everyone to have access, accessibility, and equity, but many times we just don't notice that there are, the gaps are or what these gaps are. Um, can you give us some simple kind of curriculum changes so we can make sure to shrink the gap? So one of the items that we work with is we uh, push our curriculum through our uh, its learning. So what that means is that you just don't get a lesson. You actually get a series and packages of materials. You'll have a student facing uh, page ready to go for the student to see and interact. You have teacher notes ready to go that are invisible to the student. Um, each of them have uh, different components that are aligned. So whether you have ELL students, uh, students with accommodations, you have all these things that are packaged into this giant lesson. And so by making these small changes, we have uh, dramatically increased the use of uh, the district curriculum and the way teachers are getting feedback to us to improve the way we write curriculum uh, as a whole. Um, so those are, these, those are really truly simple things to do. All, all we did is we looked at their end user, we asked them what are you looking to do, what are you wanting to have when you have a district lesson, because you know if you ever had a cookie cutter district lesson, you notice that uh, you get a little bit of everything and not everything is, uh, fits your needs. And so what we did is we created, uh, I, the way I like to think about it is like, we give you all the ingredients to make a pizza. You make it to fit your needs. You take what you want and you keep what you need. And that's it. 
Well, I know Alan talked about um, information, how important that is. And I think something about uh, um, students is sometimes we don't have all the information of how they're struggling or, you know, what gaps. I don't think even sometimes the students are, you know, have that information as well. So um, what are ways that we can all get informed, parents, teachers, students? So one of the biggest things to get everybody informed is building that sense of community. Um, and that really starts off at what standards and procedures you set in place in your school, in your district. For example, in our district, whenever we use its learning, the first thing the uh, students see automatically is our dashboard. Um, when we had the last incident uh, at Parkland, uh, there was a message that uh, the, the superintendent posted on the dashboard so every single student in our district could see. Okay? So that's how we, we build the, uh, that sense of community. We say, hey, this is the focal point where we all meet. Now, in addition to that, we also provide students with the ability to go in into the system and show them how to look at, for data. So for instance, we use the library. Uh, some schools are using the library. They, we have uh, items that have been curated for us. Uh, they can, a student can say, hey, I'm learning about sales. Let me type up sales. And everything that, that's gone through there either comes from their textbook or it's been better as an educational resource. So we don't have them going off in Google land and returning with things that might uh, be uh, not appropriate for them. Uh, we have them all in a, in a safe, secure environment that is part of their school in the district community. I think another part of um, equity too and accessibility is uh, students sometimes who feel like they're behind or they're challenged, they don't kind of speak up or feel empowered. And so I think a great important part of that piece is empowering them to help themselves. So. What are ways that you're able to help the students, you know, help themselves? So at times, the, I think the best way to do it is to let teachers know it's okay to remove yourself from the stage and let them take the lead on the training uh, on their own learning. Um, the library, amazing. You know, if you show the students how to search for content, it's easy for them to interact with it. Makes a world of difference for them. Also, um, right now we currently have uh, student interns at my, uh, in my department. They are creating digital skills courses for students that are going to be pushed district-wide. So we're having them create their own learning, and then all we're doing is just vetting and making sure that there's no spelling and grammar mistakes. Um, so those are the things that we, the way that I see uh, reducing inequalities when it comes to education is by empowering the students to be able to take risks search for resources, and building a community where they, can, they feel empowered to do so. So if a student comes and says, hey, I really would like to create a course for my, uh, for my classmates, the answer we should always give them is, sure, why not? Right? Because the only way kids are going to become better learners is if we let them teach other kids. Well, thank you very Thanks. much. <laughs> And now we have Crystal Weiss, uh, who is an ed tech facilitator at Spring Branch ISD. And she's going to talk about the benefits of integrating on a single platform. Uh -huh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I have this, am I, can you hear me? It's a weird. Yeah. <laughs> OK, good. Yeah. So how do we show teachers the why of using the learning management system and also the benefits? So this is kind of. Our soapbox in our district is that we always want to start with the why. When you're looking at a learner management system, it's learning is the one that we're speaking of, but anything like that, it's huge, it's massive. And it has this great power to transform what's going on in their classrooms, but if they think that they have to come and they must learn it in order to check something off of the box or because their principal told them or because it's a district mandate, then that's not going to work. They're not going to continue using it. And we saw that from the get-go when we were rolling out It's Learning. We were doing three-hour how-to. So here's how you use the platform. Here's how you make this. Here's how you make that. And nobody used it. And so we could see with the data, there's nobody touching this platform. It's not, we haven't moved the needle. So the next summer we decided Let's start with the why. Let's look at what the challenges are in the classroom, and let's start from there. What is your challenge? Pick one. Don't pick all of them. Start really small. Is it that you want to do 
better small group instruction. You want to meet the needs of your lowest learners or your highest learners instead of just in the middle. Do you want to duplicate yourself so that you have more time in your day? Do you want students to have voice and choice or to make goals and follow through with them? Whatever it is, we ask them, what is your why? And here's how it's learning can help you with just a teeny bit, just a little piece of the pie so that they could see, yes, this is really super important because I cannot meet the challenges in my classroom if I don't have a place to, my students can go to get the resources that I need to give them. We're one person in that classroom and you have all of these students with all of these needs. And so having this integrated hub where the kids can go to get whatever they need that you've put there for them that, or that they can search for themselves is gonna help you meet those challenges. And once you meet one challenge, then you can go forward and meet another challenge and meet another challenge. So it may be that that loss of control is just a teeny piece and maybe we can get past that hump of you're taking my job away from me if they just get a little bit at a time, if we just can find why we're gonna do it. And I know the other part is, you know, when we start integrating technology and we can use all, it's great that, you know, it's learning, you can use all these apps and everything like that. But I know I get so excited and I sign up for like a hundred things. I have like a hundred emails from everywhere. Um, so, you know, what are some tips for kind of, you know, not just like doing that, like getting all of the sign, but you know, picking the ones that are really important and right for the students. Right, so we're ISTE, so we've seen 10 million new things yeah. today. So, I mean, we have all signed up for a million things and we probably do. We've already forgotten the passwords for half of it because we just started. So I would always say first, you really do have to again, start with your why. Why, don't use a tool because it's flashy and cute and beautiful. And we, I'm guilty. I love the flashy, cute, and beautiful. If something <laughs> has a unicorn or a rainbow on it, I'm like, yes, we must use this right now. But if I am not actually looking at, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, but if I'm not looking at what instructional goal do I have, and will this tool actually help with that instructional goal, then I don't need to use that tool. My kids don't need to be using a tool just because it has unicorns on it. It doesn't matter how <laughs> cute it is. If it's not helping me with my challenges in my classroom, then I don't need to be doing that. Another big piece is check with your district. If your district does not approve the use of that tool and it follows oh, your tip. integration and it goes with your learning goal and it's gonna be actually fabulous and truly help your students learn and then you get in there and it's blocked, then you've wasted a lot of time and energy learning that tool and integrating it for nothing. And we have to take into account privacy policies. We've all, I mean, we've been inundated for the past month with all the updates. So thank you, Europe, we're very appreciative. So we have to really think about privacy as even in my role, I don't have time. I don't wanna say I don't have time. I just don't read the privacy policies. I'm, I'm gonna check it and say yes, I hope somebody somewhere is taking care of me. That's what your district office is for. They really are going through with a fine tooth comb and it drives us insane because we want to use it right now because I needed it yesterday, <laughs> but they're gonna take care of you and take care of your kids. So make sure that you check with that first. Sorry, I have notes, I just wanna make sure. Um, one thing that I always look for is, is it easy to get started with but then can it go deeper? Can I find multiple uses for it? Can my kids hop on today and make something really quickly? And I think something like Google Slides or Adobe Spark. You can jump in and you can make something really quickly, but then there's a depth to that tool. So it's not gonna be a one and done. It's gonna be a tool that you and your students can use over and over and over again. A question that I always like to ask my teachers is, are you teaching the students that this tool is good for showcasing this type of knowledge or to meet this goal? So it's not just that we have to make slides for everything. Maybe what they're showing you is not for slides. Maybe they could be better used with a Google Doc or it may just be that they need to do a presentation and just talk to somebody. 
So they need to have that tool belt and understand that the tools that they use have a purpose, other than being cute and flashy and making things beautiful, that they can use it over and over again in a plethora of different ways. Well, yes. Oh, no, my <laughs> last one is interoperability. So it is a big, huge word, and it just means that everything works together. And if you're working with an LMS, you want your tools and that LMS to marry each other and live in harmony and not be fighting. So do check and make sure that there is interoperability. You want to be able to get your data out and do something with it. That was my last one. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I actually want to thank all our panelists for their great insights and experience. Good job. I think Jill. Or... <laughs> thank you, um, all of our speakers today. today and um, we'll take some questions from the audience um, so we, we've heard a lot today about um, creating these comprehensive <laughs> flexible and effective learning environments for students we've heard from speakers from various districts across the country um, any questions from anyone for our speaker <coughs> Um, so I can't read your names, but the um, person who just spoke last in the middle. Crystal. Crystal, thank you. I feel like I can, it's so tiny. Um, it, this, and anyone can answer this, but um, I hear you all speaking of choice and um, allowing students this, like, you know, options and not just make this presentation file or write this paper. Um, how do you, so I'm pulling that into my classes, and how do you manage after the students have a few, know a few <coughs> options, managing that idea of like, you can choose what you want to do um, and not having them, like overwhelming them with, you know, how do you manage just that, that piece of giving them the choice um, and then them being able, not being overwhelmed with the selection of choices they may have? All right. So I'll say how I would handle that and then just, I would always say, and everyone will probably agree, it's what feels good in your classroom. So that's the easy answer. But I would say that if you have front loaded with this is the type of tool for this kind of showcasing, then, and making sure that they understand that. And it's not, you may get to three or four tools in their tool belt. Like if you're in kindergarten, you're gonna take a long time to get them using that one tool, so it may be that that is their one tool. But hopefully when they get to you, they have many, and you've really done a great job of helping them to understand that if I need to present information whole group, that Google Slides is the best way. Or if I want to put something online that's going to be for a mass amount of people, that doing a short video is going to be the best way. And then if they are feeling overwhelmed, letting, letting them come to you and just sometimes just your favorite one or the one you like the most is the one that is there. But just rooted in their why. What is your goal for, for this project or this presentation? And then kind of helping them understand what those different tools are. I would, I would add too, our district's framework is universal design for learning. And I, I was an AP biology teacher and 50% of my evaluation was based on giving students choice, and that's frightening, uh, knowing that I have that AP bio test coming up at the end of the year. So I really kind of started slow and gave students two or three options, uh, especially for assessments for me was difficult, um, and made sure that it was like, so a homework assignment for a unit, making sure that it, it met my, our, my standards, uh, and then didn't give as many options on a formal assessment where they're practicing for, for some of those state tests, but uh, just start slow, keep building, and then the students will get more comfortable. Hopefully won't always take the easy way out, but uh, what's yeah. best for them, but there's some coaching there too. I would say real quick, a resource I know, shakeuplearning.com, <coughs> Casey Bell, she has choice menus. And those are actually really cool, so I would look those up. <laughs> One of the things that Casey does too that I used to do is I, I, the way that I started with choice is I did tic-tac-toe boards. 
Yeah. So I did exactly. um, as a language as a language yeah. teacher. I would have a ta I would have tasks that were written, tasks that were auditory, and tasks that were artistic. And students got to choose what they wanted to do as long as their choices made tic tac toe. Um, and I usually did the the board, the space in the middle, rather than it was the free space. But that free space was for them to create a project of their own design that met with whatever we were learning. So that was a good way for me to start because I was offering them choice, but within a controlled set of options. Yep. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, I guess, the second part of that choice, um, focusing on students monitoring their process, their progress. Um, does it's a learning or another tool um, help with that student self-regulating and self-monitoring on their growth? I, I can answer that shortly. Um, <laughs> it, the platform is so diverse, it's learning specifically, that there's multiple ways to do it. So we have some teachers that will set up uh, discussion boards and set permissions so that they're talking to certain students. Some will do it through messaging. It also has a mentoring tool that is just specifically for goals. So some of our special ed teachers will even use that for just progress and IEP goals. Uh, but it's also been used for projects as well. And there's, you know, there's a ton of other tools out there like Google Keep and, and other productivity tools that you can embed in an LMS or just have that open line of communication. But that is so important to keep track and make sure that uh, you have checkpoints in. Those years that I've had to, where I had to teach two classes in the same period, um, one of the ways that I did that was by preloading everything into its learning so that then I could, you know, they would go in, they would, you know, do, when I was working with French 2, French 3 would be working through their individual learning activities, and then I would turn around, French 2 would be, have their time for their independent, and I would be working directly with French 3. And then at the end of the day, I could go through and I could look and see who hadn't done certain activities. Some of them were required, some of them weren't, and so the ones that didn't, with just the push of a button, I could remind them, I could send a reminder to all of them to say, hey, you were supposed to have done this and you didn't do it. And so it did help, you know, at the beginning of the year, obviously, like I'd be sending out, you know, 25 reminders. And by November, or so I was only maybe sending out one or two to those one or two kids that are, you know, constantly not doing things. Because we, we always have at least one or two of those. <laughs> My favorite piece of the platform is the learning objectives report. So it's learning will ingest your state standards or common core standards. If you're using common core, we have the TEKS. And at all of your TEKS or your standards are in the course, and you tie those to the tests that you give, and it's learning you tie them to the assignments that you give. So then the students can go and they can look at that objective. They can see how many times they've been assessed. They can see what their score is for each of those assessments. And they can see if they've mastered it or not. And based on that, then they can look at that and they can, and hopefully you have these great resources because it's all integrated <coughs> in this perfect world uh, where interoperability is working <laughs> wonderfully. And they can go to the library and they can look for that standard and find resources to help them if they have not gotten it yet. Yeah, it's actually, when you come down to it, it's all about customization. What makes sense for your, for your school, for your kids. Um, because just like she said, you can have various classes in one single period, and you can give them the same experience, but even though they'll have different things for them to do. Um, and they'll be seamless. I mean, even not, not just for uh, classes where you have multiple class periods, but even when you have uh, accommodations for your special ed population. Um, they will have the same uh, sequence of items, they'll have the same things, but you can customize the platform in a way that, wow, okay, I have plants here, a file named plants, so does this kid over here, but Unless you look deep inside of it, you won't notice that they've been uh, modified for the accommodations. But for the end user, for the kid, it, they just see it, everything's the same. Great. Any other questions for our speakers? That's a good question. <laughs> they've asked some good ones. <laughs> Uh, this question is for Alan. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm curious as to the, the information you give about the peer, um, you know, asking questions of your peers and having them teach, how, that, how you see that applying to adult learners. This is going to kill my business. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm a great believer that teachers should identify what they want to work on. 
Yeah. And as long as we give them some skills, good research, and networking globally. And so the, the traditional uh, uh, come to a workshop, learn how to do this, led by somebody like me, is going to go away. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be replaced by teachers who are self-directed. And then share with one another in networks. But I think we've underestimated a teacher's ability to identify what they need to work on. And if they own it, if they own their own staff development and they own their own assessment of their own growth, I think we'll see more growth. So when you go to countries like uh, Japan or Finland, you see a lot more of that than in this country. This country still tends to have a top-down uh, telling teachers what to do, culture, and I've seen other ways of doing it, so that's where I'm voting. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, when you talk about personalized learning and performance-based learning and you, and you talk about um, giving kids voice and choice, as a special educator, it all makes sense, students meeting the needs of their IEP based on their learning styles or learning differences. When you try to expand that as a high school principal to your general ed teachers and to your parent base, um, my teachers are having trouble explaining that to a parent base used to coming in and wanting to see class averages and then want all the students to take the same test. Have you dealt with any situations where you've had to kind of defend or actually had to maybe share with the community on how to read the assessments and make it more personalized and not just generally the bell curve? I, I, I'm usually called in to do a lot of parent workshops. And I, I'm the bad guy, you know? Um, <laughs> Parents don't know what they don't know, typically. They think the best school is the one they went to sometimes, and the role, traditional roles. So for example, do you know Wolfram Alpha? Do you happen to know Wolfram Alpha? So most parents don't know Wolfram Alpha. And, and with Wolfram Alpha, if you teach a parent how to use it with their child, we can empower parents. We can give parents tools to make them, I think, Parents are feeling that sense of loss that doctors were feeling in, in the toilet model. And I think a role of a school moving forward is to do proactive parent engagement, where you empower parents with tools, such as Wolfram Alpha. I think we should completely redesign how we do parent night at schools, completely. Where we're teaching them and empowering them rather than the traditional tour of 10 minutes per teacher. That didn't help you, but. I, I would say so we have UDL as our framework. We're 80% inclusion for every student 80% of the time, or at least that's the goal. So we have pushback from parents of special needs students and general ed students. Um, and, and I just over communicate. Uh, we have Facebook groups going, we have parent nights uh, just explaining, showing uh, them our data in terms of if, if they are afraid that students aren't gonna perform as well. Um, but that would be my advice and you're more than welcome to, I'm more than welcome to talk to you privately about it as well. No, um, going based on Alan's point, uh, over informing parents is always the best way, uh, best approach. Um, in our district, we have a special ed conference that happens uh, once a year. And it is, it's like ISTE. It's like what we have right now. There's choice sessions for parents. Parents will come in. We'll have, uh, I mean, my team and I had a session on how to, all the different digital resources available for parents from brain pop for its learning, how to navigate and use those. I mean, and what that does, it empowers the parents not to just to look at the assessments, but also be like, okay, so I know your teacher's using this book, but I know for a fact you also have access to two, these two other resources. 
let's use these other resources. And that it, it gives them, especially when you have parents that are uh, they're ELL learners themselves. So we have a high population um, that has that. And so empowering them give, not only helps the child, but also <coughs> helps the family as a whole because it provides them access to resources. We have parent you, and I, it's never even crossed my mind to do like sessions on personalized learning and reading assessments. So nope. thank you all. It, I appreciate <laughs> that. We'll be adding that to the session. It, it, it was not my idea. It was our superintendent. <laughs> I would give her, but yeah. That's a good question. It's a yes on the parent piece. And again, it's learning is very customizable. So what the parents see depend, depends on what your district decides. Like we don't use the grade book as our grade book of records. So we don't have that on for the parents because we don't want them to see things that were maybe done in its learning but didn't get transferred to, the, our, to our SIS. So we keep that piece turned off. So yes, there is a parent piece. There's also groups built in so that you could have community groups. So your PTA groups could be in there. You could have parent book clubs. You could have, like I always was really sad that my daughter's uh, middle school musical wasn't using groups because it would be so much easier than trying to juggle the emails and the reminds and the pieces of paper coming home and all their music that they had to practice. So they have that piece also. I, there's not an easy, super duper easy way to share across districts, but it's learning gets us together. And then you can share in the library across. So it's not, I don't, y'all step in because I'm yeah. new. So <clears throat> exactly what she said. I mean, we're, we know each other from the user, user end, so we collaborate. And if I'm having an issue, I will reach out to them and be like, hey, this is not working. At the same point, if just uh, teachers among themselves build collaboratives, uh, from the district level, we do have training boot camps that happen on a continual basis. And these, these are the uh, spots where teachers meet each other and they meet their uh, campus contact or district contact. Um, but it, yeah, it's just, again, it goes back to like the sense of community that the district as a whole pushes forward when you get an LMS. But just now, um, this would be a great place to have a little user meetup. We should have a little <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a good idea. Any other questions for our speakers today? Okay. Um, well, I do want to thank um, Alan and Shelly and Angela, Adrian, Crystal, and Nick, um, all of you for sharing your thoughts um, on our topic today. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience um, for joining us for lunch. We're happy that you took time out of your busy schedules to join us for this. Um, if you would like to learn more about It's Learning, please visit us at the exhibit hall. We're in booth 2358, and we're also giving away a lot of um, nice prizes throughout the days, um, so we hope to see you again there. Um, thank you. Thank you.